thank you very much for inviting me and it's lovely to see so many people um, i'm particularly looking forward to the q a and i should say from the start feel free to ask absolutely anything whether it's about conservation writing a book or um, anything i've done very happy to answer what and hear from you any any thoughts you have um, and uh, after such a beautiful introduction i was um, what i'm going to say might be slightly obsolete but i at least have some pictures uh, this is me studying butterfly migration for my PhD. Here I am doing field work in Gibraltar. And inside that barrel is a butterfly that's glued to a rod. So it's flying on the spot. And I'm looking at the flight path it would have taken if it wasn't inside a barrel so that we can think about the compass mechanisms. How does a butterfly like the Painted Lady make its incredible migration from Africa to Europe? I then worked for a startup company developing the technology to use honeybees in airport security. Uh, it was great fun. Uh, I was very good at training bees. Humans are very good at this, but it turns out that automatically training bees is much harder. So uh, it went under before this ever came to market, but it was still a fascinating project to work on. Then, absolutely, I worked for the Royal Society of Biology or Society of Biology as it was back then. Um, which was a really lovely experience. I just met so many brilliant people and got involved with such a diversity of projects. So I still still miss them, which means it's even nicer to be invited to speak to you today. Uh, currently, I'm working with the Nobel Prizes. Uh, so most of my colleagues are in Stockholm, where the Nobel Prize is administered. and. Uh, until the pandemic, I was doing a lot of traveling, taking laureates to meet students around the world with the aim of inspiring young scientists. Um, and hopefully I'm going back to that soon, but we've also been doing a lot of digital work online and discussing topics at the interface of science and society, uh, future of aging, for example. Uh, I've also been a trustee of the Galapagos Conservation Trust. And alongside that, I've been increasingly doing some more writing. I published my first popular science book about genetically modified foods because I really felt there was a gap in the market for someone taking a balanced view who wasn't trying to argue one particular way or other, but presenting more of the science. Uh, but since then, I've aimed bigger, both in terms of a bigger publisher and uh, possibly an even bigger topic about conservation ethics how do we choose what to save because i realized that in conservation we're always picking winners and losers and we're not always giving a huge amount of thought as to how we do this so each of my chapters is set up as a debate between two species we have salmon versus seals the um white tip shark uh, versus the white tip reef, reef shark and sometimes this is simply funds are flowing towards one and we're ignoring the other, as is the case of bees and wasps, for example. But sometimes the work that you put in to protect one species is directly to the detriment of the other. There's no way of avoiding these, these conflicts, even if we had unlimited resources. And as my background was science, I approached this initially from a very scientific point of view. Uh, to give you an example, as some of you may well be familiar with the sharing versus sparing debate in agriculture. Uh, so we, we have a species such as the Scottish crossbill, which is the UK's an only endemic bird found in the Cairngorms National Park in the Scottish Highlands. And this is a male, it has this amazing curved beak, which is a perfect adaptation for opening pine cones. But this means that however much you do wildlife friendly farming, for example, the Scottish crossbill is not going to benefit. It's a habitat specialist and requires that very specific habitat. So the best way to protect species such as the Scottish crossbill is not to improve how environmentally friendly our farming is, but to really farm as intensively as we can so that we spare enough land for nature. We um, have some land for human activity, some land for nature, and it's relatively separate. 
Whereas if we take the yellow hammer, for example, which is a, in contrast to the Scottish crossbill, a very widespread bird, but still declining greatly. And one of the big reasons for that is that our farms have become more intensive and there are few weeds, fewer seeds, farms are much tidier, which means that there is less space for wildlife. And to help the more generalist species like the yellow hammer, the best thing to do would be to make our farming more wildlife friendly. Probably that would mean yields went down, but we would still have more wildlife on that land. However, if that means we're taking more land for agriculture, then specialist species like the Scottish crossbill don't have so much habitat less left. And it turns out that the way to protect most species would be the initial share sparing scenario. So we farm very intensively, then we protect habitat specifically for nature. And my original approach as I started researching this was that's the kind of scientific knowledge we need. But as I, as I will come to, I realized that that is not enough. I had started from that point of, well, obviously we need to protect more species. That's what we're aiming for. And that is the kind of thing that we need to critically examine and isn't being done enough. I was also being concerned by how much we love bees and pandas, but we're really not that interested in all sorts of species. Uh, plants in particular are generally ignored, despite the incredible diversity of species. Um, of the plants that we do care about more, it tends to be trees, but even then trees are stealing too much of the limelight. And in fact, one of my case studies was about introducing herbivores to get rid of trees, because in the Siberian Arctic, actually herbivores who clear away the snow, for example, uh, protecting the soil, that's how you store more carbon because the soil stores more carbon than the trees. Uh, but we don't tend to think about the nematodes, the bacteria, the fungi in the soil. They are not what conservation tends to be focused on. And you've got uh, species such as seagrass, which is in fact an alga that stores more carbon per hectare than a tropical rainforest, but it's not attracting the right kind of attention. Uh, what conservation also tends to have little interest in is common species such as plantains, which you're probably familiar with from your garden. And interestingly, they have been introduced around the world, particularly in the Americas. And in fact, one of the old names for the plantain in America was white man's footprints, because they're just so prolific in their tiny seeds, and they would get stuck in shoes, for example. So wherever European settlers went, the plantains would spring up. There was no way of avoiding it. And Probably in a traditional conservation narrative, well, that's really bad. A common species becomes really common on another continent, but it brought benefits, uh, not just for people who would use it to um, treat injuries, for example, but even the um, Edith's checkerspot butterfly was struggling in America, particularly as the climate changed, there was more drought, the native species that they were using as their food plant dried up earlier in the season. Plantains, on the other hand, lasted longer. They managed to retain their moisture and so it was suitable as that butterfly's food plant longer into the year. So the butterfly was adapting to using them. Just the kind of thing that shows how incredible our forgotten species can be. Uh, and if people ignore plants, they really tend to vilify parasites. Very few people are into my idea of a parasite conservation charity. And uh, it's incredibly rare to see any conservation funding for parasites. This is a horsehair worm, a nematomorph, in this case, wriggling out of a cricket. Uh, I don't have a video to show today, but if you are interested to see this spectacle, then head to YouTube and um, Google horsehair worm and cricket, something like that, and you will uh, find some gruesome videos. And the worm as an adult is free living in the stream. It doesn't feed, but it's there only to reproduce. It's tiny larvae infect insect larvae in this drawing, a um, mayfly. Uh, 
the mayfly larva will develop, then it'll become an adult flying free from the stream. Um, mayflies don't live very long at all, can be hours or days as adults. But when the mayfly dies, the larva is still, still alive inside it. And what the hairworm hopes is that a cricket will come along and scavenge that mayfly, at which point the hairworm will infect the cricket, it will grow into an adult worm, it doesn't have a functioning gut, it just absorbs nutrients um, through its skin, and it will absorb everything that's not essential for the cricket's survival, it's uh, the fats, reproductive organs, for example. But then the problem is that the hairworm needs the stream to complete its life cycle, and crickets are, of course, ter terrestrial animals. However, crickets infected with hairworms through an amazing trick of mind control become attracted to the stream, and they're much more likely to jump into the stream if infected with hairworms, at which point the hairworm can wriggle free and the life cycle can continue. And we're only just starting to understand how parasites can manipulate ecosystems and how important they are to ecosystem functioning. Uh, this example is from a Japanese stream system and the fish is a karakuchi char, it's an endangered trout. And studies have shown that a large proportion of its diet is these crickets that have jumped into the stream. So, if the crickets weren't jumping into the stream, not only would that be bad for the fish, but it could also be bad for the other aquatic invertebrates because the fish would more be feeding on these. So you think maybe it's bad for the mayfly larva to be infected by a cricket, but that's not necessarily true. Actually, sorry, infected by a hairworm. Actually, the hairworm is not necessarily preventing it becoming an adult, but it is possibly preventing it from being eaten. So if we went down the route of hairworm conservation, then we could have great benefits for the ecosystem and for other species. Uh, we could also think about protect the, protecting the surrounding habitat, which would protect both the hairworm and the, and the wider ecology. In this particular case study in Japan, the hairworms and the crickets are declining, and the reason is that lots of the native forest has been replaced by plantations. However, we've got to remember that the plantations were there for a reason. And this is where I started to understand that science is not enough. Anyone who thinks they are answering questions about conservation priorities, for example, based on science, is just failing to understand the values that they're being driven by. And I actually think the pandemic has provided a good example of this. There have been lots of calls to follow the science. And those calls have been following the science about how coronavirus cases are going up. However, you could equally have made a call to follow the science about children's mental health and what keeping them out of education was doing to them. So anyone who said follow the science related to the increase in COVID cases was automatically saying what I am most concerned about now is preventing deaths from coronavirus. What this does for these children's futures is a secondary point. And I'm not in any way here casting, making a value judgment about which is more important. It's just an illustration that anyone who was following the science was really only following the science to lead them to the end that matched their values. Uh, so with that in mind, I wanted to think about, well, what is valuable in conservation? And this was another revelation to me in the process of writing my book that people do think about this as a job. It is not just people with an interest in nature sitting around proclaiming where they think value lies. It is philosophers who are critically analysing this. Uh, and here I'm talking about intrinsic value. And this is value that exists or for something in its own right. Uh, so taking my thought experiment to illustrate this, this is actually adapted from the 
last man thought experiment first put forward by Richard Sylvan, the philosopher in 1973. I've adapted it partly to make it the last human thought experiment as we're moving away from gendered language, but also I just changed the wording a bit to really be very clear that what I'm talking about is the intrinsic value of a species. So imagine you're the last person alive, when you're gone, the only life remaining will be plants, microbes, fungi, algae, nothing that can think or feel. Uh, for some reason, the following thought runs through your head. Before I die, it'd be nice to make the baobab tree extinct just for fun. Are you morally wrong? And I suspect some of you have a gut reaction to this that, of course, you're wrong to intentionally make a species extinct. But in this situation, there are no humans, no animals who can be affected by this. You're about to die. Um, so we, if you answer that you are morally wrong to do this, what we're saying is that species have intrinsic value, value that just exists in its own right, irrespective of their impact. Uh, to think about this, let's start with looking at where we do tend to put value. This is me and my grandmother. Philosophers have largely agreed that individual humans have intrinsic value. My grandmother is valuable in her own right, not just because of the positive impact she has on me. And that's because she has the capacity to feel pleasure and pain. Uh, if her needs are not met, she will suffer. And that is morally relevant. And I think that's how all of us live our life as well, believing that humans have value in their own right and that their needs are morally important. Uh, and increasingly, we're feeling the same way about animals, particularly primate species, for example, because they too have a capacity to experience the world, they have a capacity to suffer, and so their needs as individuals are morally relevant. And we might have some kind of scale here, we might decide that a frog, an individual frog, doesn't have the same value as an individual human, but that doesn't mean the frog has no value. It still has a value in itself, regardless of its impact on anything else. What about a plant? Well, a plant doesn't have that capacity to think or feel. And that is why we tend to think it's fine to eat a carrot, but we debate about whether it's okay to eat a cow. What about a species? Well, likewise, a species has no capacity to think or feel. What does a species want? Uh, this is a quote from philosopher Elliot Sober, who asks, given that most species have, ex have gone extinct, perhaps that's what they really want. And it's just us who frustrates this national tendency, natural tendency. Uh, and what he's, he's not really saying that we are frustrating a species natural tendency. The point is that a species can't want anything. So any kind of moral direction that we've been getting from what is good for humans, what is good for animals, we can't have the equivalent for what is good for a species. Uh, we would also have practical problems for trying to claim that species has intrinsic value uh, including that species isn't a neat category, particularly when we look at plants, you can't say, well, this plant is from one species, that plant is from another species. There are lots of blurred lines, which of course we would expect given evolution because uh, species don't just suddenly appear, they gradually evolve from another species. So if species isn't a neat category and is constantly changing, well, how can we say that that arbitrary category has some kind of intrinsic moral value? Uh, the same is true of ecosystems. Change is the one constant in nature. What would we, how would we define an ecosystem being in its correct state, that somehow it is morally superior if it looks a particular way? Uh, one way people try and do this is look at historic baselines, but why would we say that one moment in history is that's when an ecosystem was right we need to try and return it to how it was then that that's an arbitrary based baseline it's a random snapshot in time uh, we can't say that it's based on the absence of humans uh, because humans evolved as part of nature 
and uh, most indigenous societies still see themselves that way. Uh, plenty of indigenous societies don't have the word for wild, for example, because they have no concept of being separate from nature. That's not how they experience the world. Uh, so we can't say an ecosystem is superior if it's not impacted by humans, which is lucky because if that was true, then conservation would be pointless because any efforts we made to restore ecosystems would also be human impact and somehow devalue ecosystems themselves. So we have to reject this idea that humans taint nature just because of our existence. Um, people also sometimes look at putting intrinsic value in genes. That's much less common. And I think the reason is that that's not how we perceive the world. Until relatively recently, we didn't know that DNA existed. So why would we have said that actually what nature really needs is for that gene to survive and it is of an intrinsic value. We have a moral responsibility that that gene or that DNA sequence survives. That's just as logical as saying the same thing about species, but it's not natural to us because we, we can't see a gene. We don't see the world that way. Um, the same is true of biodiversity. There's lots of different definitions of biodiversity. There's no objective measurement. So if we haven't even decided what biodiversity is, how can we say that it has um, intrinsic value in itself? And if we did say that biodiversity had intrinsic value, then we might have to act quite differently. Uh, for example, we, could, we should try and create more diversity. We should have some polluted environments so that uh, bacteria evolve to get new genetic uh, sequences because that's increasing diversity. But really, when people say they want to protect biodiversity, that's not what they mean. Uh, we could also think about assigning value to inanimate objects. Uh, this photo is taken on Jeju Island off the south coast of South Korea. And that mountain at the back here is called Mount Dan, and it has bad feng shui because of its shape. And in other societies, people do assign these kind of values to river systems, to sacred places, to rock formations. And that's not tend, doesn't tend to be how we act in the West, but that is um, no more logical to put value in life than value in a rock, unless we're talking about any ability to experience the world. And if we start to say things like, well, one rock that should be that shape. It's wrong to change that rock. Then we're in big trouble. Um, so this is just a good way of thinking about how other people can see the world and helps us interrogate our views about what we have just intuitively considered to be important. Uh, and all this really matters because a lot of things are done in the name of conservation that harm people and animals. Uh, for example, evictions of people in what's come to be known as fortress conservation, put up a big wall to protect nature from people. And it's there's been lots and lots of cases of indigenous communities being evicted from land to protect it for nature. Uh, and this is ongoing. There's currently uh, resistance from Maasai who are being displaced from their land in Tanzania, for example. One famous example is the Kruger National Park, which really illustrates how colonialism and conservation grew up together. Uh, Paul Kruger was a controversial figure. He led various wars of dispossession and he was an avid hunter. So he created a game reserve. And over time, this expanded and it was reframed as wilderness, which is uh, common with the US national parks as well. What had been a cultural landscape inhabited by indigenous people became reframed as virgin wilderness protected for nature. And in the case of Kruger, as so many places, traditional lifestyles became criminalized. It's not just about removing people from their land, it's about stopping them collecting firewood or hunting, engage in the activities that had been their livelihoods. Uh, Kruger has recently expanded to become a 
transboundary park with Limpopo in Mozambique. And it, in many ways, it's been a great success story. But for lots of people living in Mozambique, it's become a problem. Um, and here, the evictions are not forced. You, they are villages are being offered the chance to relocate. But actually, there's complaints from villages that the relocation isn't happening fast enough because they may still be allowed to live within the boundaries of the park, but if they're banned from their traditional livelihoods, then they uh, they can't survive there. So the force of the eviction has just come about in a different way through the making of rules. Uh, what's quite common with this kind of conservation is a militarized approach, um, including a sort of shoot on site policy for rhino poachers. And I'm just going to give you a moment to read this quote because I thought it was very powerful. just gives an insight into how Western conservation and ecotourism can be seen. But really access to nature in this situation becomes the, uh, the privilege of a rich few. And in Africa, there's a great racial divide here. Um, that people are now making money from the land for ecotourism whilst preventing the original inhabitants from making money and maintaining livelihoods there. There is no easy path forward here, but we could think about, for example, really making sure people are provided with an alternative livelihood and an alternative livelihood that is culturally acceptable so that they are not forced to go into things such as poaching and also dismantle, for example, the trade in rhino horn, because actually that's where the people with the power and people make the profits tend to be. Uh, which means there are positive stories that in many places, granting indigenous land rights can protect the forest. Um, across the tropics, it seems that in general, indigenous areas are just as effective as official protected areas at reducing forest degradation and deforestation, often with a fraction of the costs and without some of the rights issues that are occurring. And actually in Africa, indigenous lands experience less deforestation than protected areas, particularly in tropical Africa. So if we're going to really work towards bringing indigenous knowledge and indigenous culture into conservation, we have to understand that Western science has a certain way of acting, and that isn't the only way. Um, even if we're talking about indigenous lands rights, these can often be negotiated in terms that are just alien to local people, because we have very clear ideas of land ownership, but indigenous societies don't own land in that same way but they're still being expected to negotiate land rights based on the system that we are used to. Uh, and actually they have lots of knowledge, scientific knowledge, and that might be embedded in songs, rituals, customs, for example. It's not gonna end up in a scientific paper. It hasn't been collected using uh, quadrats or drones. It's just been knowledge built up over generations. And there's increasing recognition that this can be extremely useful knowledge to conservation. The Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is the equivalent of the IPCC, has been leading the way with this really, uh, accessing local knowledge, for example, holding stakeholder focus groups. So they're talking with indigenous people, um, it, going for walks with people, asking Indigenous people to take them into the forest. There's obviously some uh, need for caution here. One thing, we can't just mine Indigenous knowledge, not just extract the knowledge and not see the knowledge holders themselves benefit. And there's also inequalities within Indigenous societies. Uh, one of my interviewees for my book was a Italian lady working in Australia who was interested in uh, fish conservation in Papua New Guinea. And she was talking a lot to local people in meetings, 
And she found that women wouldn't speak up if there were men present in the meeting. So if we're really going to access knowledge from different people and hopefully then make sure these people's needs are met, then we need to think of ways of accessing that knowledge in a, a fair and accessible way. Uh, I think New Zealand is a fascinating example, uh, including the narratives around conservation and the land. Uh, the European settlers often have this idea that like the archetypal hardworking New Zealander came and claimed this uh, this land to make it productive, which now we might see as environmental degradation. And actually, Western um, conservationists do see it as environmental degradation and that humans have been a damaging impact on the environment. We need to protect the environment from humans. But neither of those colonial narratives sit quite right or fully reflect the reality. Because actually, Maori had been sustainably managing ecosystems for generations, but our preservationist form of conservation that tries to protect nature from people uh, means that Maori can no longer interact with nature in their traditional way. Um, they, for example, as is common with indigenous cultures, had um, rituals or taboos that meant you couldn't, for example, harvest a certain species at a certain time, or they had sacred places that you couldn't enter. And all of these systems that protected nature have been uh, destroyed through settlement as, as Mary have been prevented from hunting, for example. And there's a uh, dual standards that there are four bird species that can be legally hunted in New Zealand, including the grey duck, which is classed as nationally critical. Uh, however, these are species that Western hunters like. Even common species that Maori used to hunt in sustainable quantities for food, it's illegal to hunt. So we've we've have this ongoing ban on traditional livelihoods and this prioritization, prioritization of a Western way of doing conservation. Uh, conservation has a very awkward relationship with animal welfare. If a bird of prey is shot in the British uplands, this is a tragedy. Uh, we have conservationists up in arms, what an outcry, how could people do this to such a beautiful bird? But there are many situations where animals are harmed in the name of conservation. Uh, probably the classic is eradications, particularly from islands where species such as rats, cats, stoats have been wiping out species, particularly seabird species, who have no native defences, no natural defences against these introduced predators and are faced with extinction. Uh, Australia and New Zealand have suffered hugely from loss of species due to this introduction of predators that the native wildlife isn't equipped to deal with. And that's why New Zealand in particular has launched this enormous predator-free New Zealand plan to try and um, wipe out certain species such as stoats across all of New Zealand. So we are killing animals in their millions in the name of conservation, not to mention things like captive breeding programs that um, can be traumatic or even uh, trophy hunting being used to fund conservation. And if we think back to our philosophical points about each individual animal's life having value, and our inability to philosophically justify that species have intrinsic value, then uh, the prevailing attitude in conservation, whereby it's really a more, you know, it's a non-issue. Should we kill the rats? Of course we should. We don't even have to think of this because we have an obligation to protect the species. Actually, that attitude doesn't stand up to scrutiny. We can't just wash our hands of any moral responsibility for all the animals we're killing. Again, it's a very, very challenging path to, to walk. And certainly my, I had one chapter about this in my book about uh, eradications on the Galapagos Islands. And my interviewee was um, very pro this idea of, of um, culling animals, but 
that's not the same as the idea that we can wash our hands of the responsibility we have to really think carefully about when and how is it acceptable to kill an animal in order to protect species ecosystems any other broader environmental value uh, and this ties into our idea about non-native species um, and often species are killed because they're outside their historic range but where does an animal belong uh, again we would be back to the idea of having to take some arbitrary snapshot in time and say that's where an animal belongs it is somehow wrong for it to be outside its range and there might be practical reasons why we don't want them outside their range but then that's that's not the same as saying there's just some kind of intrinsic reason they don't belong somewhere and likewise if humans are part of nature it's not intrinsically wrong if humans move one species to another place doesn't mean that species that animal automatically should be killed or is morally incorrect for it to be there it just means that we've got practical considerations to talk about when we think when do we leave an introduced animal be or plant and when do we try and tackle it and how do we do that um so what can we change uh, through writing this book it became really clear to me that conservation needs to change and i think the biggest thing that needs to change is to be really careful about how we outline our goals uh, we don't just need to rethink the methods of conservation rethink is it okay that we poison lots of rats for example but also the goals of well is species conservation what's most important to us um i think we need to tackle inequalities at all levels and i don't just mean inequalities between uh, western conservationists and indigenous people for example but even within our societies there's a great uh, inequality for example in who has access to nature i have such incredible access to amazing nature and but many people who grow up in uh, less fortunate situations than me just don't have that at all and they're maybe not even welcomed into wild space spaces um, and uh, we talk a lot about biodiversity and conservation but we're not that great about human diversity um, and one of the reasons that the environmental sector is so lacking diversity is that it's really hard to get into and you often need lots of unpaid work experience and that's fine if your parents have connections or even if you're just able to spend a year or so after university volunteering working on a very low wage because your parents can take care of you for a lot of people they don't have that privilege and therefore it's impossible to get into the get into these jobs um, there's also a, a lack of women in particularly high up in conservation organizations, despite the fact that lots of lead environmental figures are women. And I'm thinking people like uh, Naomi Klein, Greta Thunberg, um, Bandari um, Shiva, amazing women leading the way, but in terms of employment, then women are not necessarily being represented in the same way that men are. And given that conservation grew out of a colonial society with a very strong hunting background led by privileged white men then we need to try and shake some of that and reassess some of those values that we've inherited um, and we also need voices in debates not just the professionals but um, i don't know about any of you who did a biology degree but i think lots of us were taught in a very particular way and it was taken for granted that biodiversity was good for example whereas people outside conservation maybe don't have that baggage that we have arrived with so we do need to listen to people without a background in conservation and with that in mind I would encourage you to to speak up because your view is very valuable and you may well be talking to people who just haven't even thought about this debate so the more people you can engage in this debate the better and it goes without saying to to listen um, if we want to hear from people with diverse views we've got to be ready to listen to them um, spending time in nature is not just very important for our own well-being but if 
people don't spend time with nature, they're less likely to value it and protect it. So not just to spend time in nature, but to encourage other people to do the same, particularly people who don't necessarily normally have the access to nature is hugely beneficial. Um, and there's different ways to create space for nature. I One of my uh, favorite little stories I researched from my book was about the edible bus stop where people have just grown fruits and vegetables around a bus stop. Well, why not? What else was that space going to be used for, but made for an amazing community resource? Uh, but ultimately, reassess our values. And I think um, capitalism has really sunk its nails deep into us. Certainly, I, I um, feel that, that way myself, uh, teaching us to value things like status, job titles, how impressive are you? It's become fashionable to be too busy, um, to have too much work. Well, that you must be important if you've got too much work. Uh, it's not necessarily the world we want to, to build. Um, and another example I like to give is, well, what do you want to do? Earn lots of money so you can buy a big toy to give to your niece or nephew. Um, well, that's just using resources. What that child really wants is your love and your attention. The, the time you spent at work could maybe be a better spent with the child. So just encouraging these different values in society, because I think if we're really going to tackle any serious environmental problems, we've got to tackle capitalism and inequality at the same time. Uh, believing we're doomed is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I know that lots of oil companies, for example, would love us to believe we're doomed because then we don't have to do anything about it. We don't have to change our ways. But actually, there are lots of signs of hope um, and also even if we don't achieve what we ultimately want to achieve, we still benefited. Maybe we're not going to keep carbon emissions down to uh, 1.5 degrees. Sorry, we're not going to keep climate change to 1.5 degrees. But even if we miss that target, every bit we do helps. Even if what we're doing um, changes it from a four degree rise to a three degree rise, well, far fewer people will suffer people and animals will suffer as a result of that. Just because we're not going to achieve our objectives doesn't mean we're not going to do something great. Um, and I have seen the time and want to get on to um, questions, but I just had a few success stories. Um, can you imagine the whole world whaling, hunting whales to extinction? Can you imagine plastic bags being given out every time you go to the shops? Society has been changing and there are more signs of change and some reasons to be hopeful. Uh, so writing this book, I expected to have conclusions about, uh, for example, biodiversity hotspots, where we should spend our money. My conclusion was that there are no right answers, that lots of these values I held dear were just personal opinions, and there's no prescriptive right answer to what the world should look like. Um, instead, I would like you to, to leave you with the question of, uh, what do we want tomorrow to look like in terms of our society and in terms of the natural world?